and Isabel are going to read a couple sections. Don't worry, just try to make sense of it, okay? I right, stand by. Quiet, please. And go. He just at scars that now felt a wound. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks. It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill you, ambitious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief. That thought, her mate, art far more fairer than she. Be not her mate, since she is ambitious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it, cast it off. It is my lady, oh, it is my love, oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses. I will answer it. I am too bold, tis not to me she speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all the heaven, having some business, do entreat her eyes, to twinkle in the spheres. Let's start with, you know, the beginning, right? The first thing you say is, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. So well, what does that mean? Breaks. Oh, I said breaks. 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 Yeah. But soft. Go ahead. Um, uh, it's like that uh, Juliet is like the sun for the Romeo, so it is like... Yeah, that's true, too. That's, that's true. But the first thing, let's go back to the very beginning. But soft is the first thing he says. Yes. What does that mean, but soft? Wait. Good. It means, shh, shh. Oh my God, hold on a second. But soft. Right? That's the yes. first. But, the first. Yes, it's like that Juliet light. Juliet's light, uh, it's like that it's um, coming from that window. Right. And. Um, Romeo just wants everybody to be quiet and to listen and to really look at Juliet because Right, but the interesting thing is he's all by himself. So who's he talking to? You know, yeah. and that's what's interesting. <laughs> he's by, he's one. He, let's even go back before that. The first thing he actually says is he jests at scars that never felt a wound. What is he talking about? Well, you don't know the play, so... He jests at scars that never felt a wound. Yeah, uh, Mercutio just uh, said something to him. Right, and, teasing uh, him. Teasing him about, yeah, well, yes, go to your woman, right. have fun, go away. Love, you're, a, you're an idiot for yeah. being in love. So Romeo is kind of wandering around, you know. They've had a few uh, cocktails probably at the party, you know. <laughs> he jests at scars. So, it's like if Alex was making fun of you, for being in love with Isabel, you know, you're a loser, dude, you know, come on, only, only wusses fall in love, right? So, he just had scars that never felt, well, he's never felt what it feels like to be in love. So that's the first beat. He just had scars that never felt a wound. Then, but soft, with light through yonder window breaks. That's the important word there, class. So you take a pen, and you underline the word breaks, okay? Because why? Because that's the verb. And this is what most people don't understand. Yes, dear? Yes, but it's just like that um, Mercutio is just making fun of him because Rome is always so passionate about love. And like that's right. That's he, right. He, he was in love with Rosaline first, and he didn't that's really right. uh, take up his theory. That's right. Because he always is so passionate and so exhilarated about love. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so that's just because he doesn't really think that Romeo does. Ready? To just get rid of him. To get rid of him. Exactly. Dismiss means get rid of him. Right? <laughs> and then go right into, but soft would like to, to go right into the text and make sure you hit the word breaks, the speech, but soft would like to read under window breaks. And make that your life, Arthur, right there. Come on, you can remember the words. Don't look at the script. <laughs> Action. <clears throat> he just at scars that never felt a wound. But soft, what light for yonder window breaks. Not bad. Now, the problem is, is that um, you're working too hard. You're, you know, you're putting power onto it. Yeah. Relax. Let the words do the work. Dismiss him. 
And then you have to really see the light. You just said the line because the line was there. He jests at scars that never felt a wound. And then see the light. You have to take the time to see the light before you say, but soft to it, light through yonder window breaks. Capiche? Or Frischen? Frischen? Okay. So one more time. Don't work so hard. Let the language do the work. Sit up straight. Sit on the edge of the chair. On the edge of the chair. Move, move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. Well, because the Shakespeare is a different language, I have to get used to it. I understand. Yeah. I understand. But the way to get used to it is to stand up straight. Okay. So dismiss him and then look and find the light. Ready? Action. He just at scars that never felt a wound, but soft. What not for yonder window breaks? Okay, not bad. But you're still working too hard, right? You know, to see the light, he's going. <laughs> Just see the light. You know what I mean? You're still working. And also, this is another tip for you. It probably is true in German as well as English. He's saying, he jests at scars that never felt a wound. Don't lean on the word never. Okay, it's a negative. Never stress a negative. It's, he jests at scars that never felt a wound. It's not he just had scars that never felt a wound. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Christian? <laughs> okay, and you're working too hard still. You need to relax and let the language do the work. Just say, with Shakespeare, you don't have to do any acting. All you have to do is say the words properly. Say them to make sense. And he'll do all the acting for you. I promise you. All you have to do is dismiss him, find the light, see it, say the words. It'll, 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 it's like rolling off a log. As they say in America. Okay, ready? Pretty sick. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Again, from the from, from it is east. the east. <clears throat> it is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the inverse moon. Who is already sick and pale with grief that thou her mage art far more fair than she Almost. Than she. That thou. Thou. That thou. Thou, thou means yeah. you. Thou. That thou her maid. Mm -hmm. Also, too, something you want to work on is pitch, right? Everything is coming. That thou her maid art far more fair. It's all the same pitch, right? Mm -hmm. That thou her maid art far more fair than she. Do you hear the difference? Yeah. Try it. Yeah, yeah. Try it. That thou made are far more fair than she. Good. Now do it from it is the east up to there. It is the east and Juliet's. You're east. stopping after east. Really? Yeah, you're I going, it is the east. Okay, and okay, you have to take a big breath. Yeah, I know what you mean. <clears throat> it is the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the ambush moon, who is already sick and pale with grief. That thou, her maid, that thou, that thou, her maid, art, art far more fair than she. Art far more fair than she. Than she. Art, say, repeat it after me. Art far more fair than she. Art far more fair than she. Good. Do it one more time from there. That thou, her maid, art far more <coughs> fair than she. Good. Keep going. Be not her maid, since she's ambitious. Since, since she is envious. 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 You know what envious means? I don't know. Okay. Nidish. 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 Right. Jealous. Jealous is different from en jealousy is different from envy though. Right, class? <coughs> jealousy means I don't want you to have that boyfriend. Envy means I want that boyfriend. There's a big difference. Jealousy is more green. <laughs> Beware of jealousy, my lord. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. Right? Jealousy will kill you. If you feel jealous, you have to transform that jealousy from what it is to something else by study, by practice. Jealousy will eat you alive. Vershin? 
<laughs> and the way is to work hard, is to try harder. Don't give up, you know? Okay, let's go back to uh, Be Not Her Maid. Be Not Her Maid, says she's envious. Her vessel livery is but thick and green, and none of but fools do wear it. Cast it off. Good! Good, now let's do that whole speech from the top up to there. Okay? Cast it off. Now at this point, he doesn't know that it's Juliet. You understand? Most people don't realize this when they read the text. They go right into the next section. But, you know, he is cast it off. And then he looks. She steps out from the shadow into the light. And he sees it is Juliet. And he goes, it is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Right? He, it, he realizes that it re up until then, he's thinking, you know, if that was her, wow, man, you know, it'd be so great because she's my, you know what I mean? Then he realizes it's actually her by chance. Her eye discourses. I will answer it. I am too bold. Right? Okay. Try it. From the beginning of the Yeah. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she said nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses. I would answer it. Her, okay. Her eye discourses. discourses. Yeah, that's okay. Say dis. Discourses. Her eye discourses. The accent's on the second syllable. Okay. Her it's eye not her eye discourses. Discourses. Okay. Her eye discourses. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. And that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses, I will answer it. I'm too bold. It is not to me she speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all the heaven having some business doing Okay, good. Eyes. That was pretty good up to there. So this is all one phrase also. Two of the fairest stars in all of heaven having some business to entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres till they return. What if her eyes were there, they in her head? The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight doth a lamp. Try it. Okay. Two of the fairest stars in all the heaven having some business to entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres till they return. Good. What if... What if her eyes were there? What if our eyes were there? They didn't Take your time with that. What? He, so he's thinking about it, right? He's like, oh my God, what if her eyes were up there with those stars? Her eyes are more beautiful than those stars, right? What if her eyes were there? And okay, take your time with it, right? There are two different thoughts. That's where you want to take your time. So think about it. Look, look at my face. What if her eyes were there? They in her head. The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight doth the lamp. Try it. What if her eyes were there in her head? Uh, you have to pause after there. Okay. What if her eyes were there, they in her head? The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight doth the lamp. Her eyes in heaven would... Uh, That's right. Her eyes in heaven would through the airy regions stream so bright that birds would sing and think it were not night. The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight doth the lamp. Her eyes in heaven would through the would through the airy re airy regions airy regions stream so bright that birds would. So kind of confused. <laughs> Her eyes in heaven would through the airy regions stream so bright that birds would sing and think it were not night. Okay. The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight doth the lamp. Her eyes in heaven would through the airy regions stream so bright that birds would sing and think it was it were not night. Oh, speak again, bright angel. Uh, she speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel, for thou art. For as, thou. For thou art as glorious to this night, being over my head. As you can't stop. Oh, she speaks. Big breath. 
O oh, speak again, bright angel, for thou art as glorious to this night, being o'er my head as is a winged messenger of heaven, unto the white, upturned, wondering eyes of mortals that fall back to gaze on him when he bestrides the lazy, pacing clouds and his sails upon the bosom of the air. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. <laughs> she speaks. O oh, speak again, bright angel. You can't stop. You can't go, O oh, speak again. Bright angel. That's what kills it, right? You have to go, Oh, speak again, bright angel, for thou art as glorious to this night being o'er my head. It's all one thought. Okay. okay, so you have to take a big breath and your eyes have to read ahead. This is what I meant to you when I said if you want to get good, read Shakespeare out loud. Just open it up and start reading it. It will teach you. It will teach you how to read it. The power of it will teach you. I promise you. I promise you. If you read Shakespeare every day, by the end of a year, you'll become a fantastic actor compared to what you were. You'll be able to take any script from any contemporary, t any contemporary piece of material, and it will be like nothing. You'll immediately figure out what it is and do it. One year? <laughs> I still do it. 35 years I'm still working on the same speech. I did this speech to get into Juilliard, and I'm still working on it here with you 35 years later. That's how you know it's good. It's like being with the same woman for 35 years and she shows you something new every time. <laughs> Oh. Romeo, oh Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Why is your name Romeo? Then deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Try it. Let's sit up straight. Also oh, on the edge of the seat. That's it. Oh Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Good, but you can't stop in between. And also, take your time with the first two Romeos, right? You're just saying, Romeo, Romeo. You know, you have to think, it's like, you have to think about that person. That, that person that, you know, how many people here have been in love? I, That's it? <laughs> okay, this is your assignment. Go out and fall in love. Okay? Find somebody and fall, even if it doesn't work out, fall in love with them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, love is strength. Well, fall in love with somebody. And all of acting is tension and release. It's tension and release. Everything. You build up and build up and build up, and then you let go. So understanding that and implementing that is your job. Okay? Let's go back to the top, okay? Mm -hmm. Straight. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art this. I get this. Okay, so what's the, the problem with that? What, what are you having difficulty with? Tis but thy name that is my enemy. That's one thought, right? Mm -hmm. You stop there. Okay. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? Mm -hmm. It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all one thought. You can use a bracket. Try it. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Okay, so what you're, you're missing is the sense of it. it. She's talking about his name, right? She just said, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Why is your name Romeo? Tis, you're not my enemy. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. That's the sense of it. You understand? You're not hitting the word name. Okay, you're not, okay that's the problem. Go ahead. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself. Though Thou art thyself. Okay. Though not a Montague. You're not your name, are you? You're not anybody but who you really are. Someone just gave you this name. You know, I could be named Herbert for all it mattered. I'd still be me, right? <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing with everything. I mean, Shakespeare was obsessed with this. Gender, you know, do you have to be, you know, a woman to really be attractive? I mean, all throughout his plays, he has women dress as men. And, and, and girls go crazy for the guy, you know? It's all throughout his plays. It's a very fascinating idea that it's this, 
essence of you that's attractive, not your name. Right? Okay, go ahead. Thou art thyself, thou art not a Montague. What's Montague? It's not, it's more hand, it's, no it, foot. It is more hand, no foot. Yeah, I'm having been the top dog to down at the bottom of the pile where nobody wants anything to do with you anymore. <clears throat> and all this comes from is a lack of discipline. You know, I said to the class uh, when I first started working with them that, you know, I mean, there is a certain amount of, of belief that is involved in becoming an actor, but it boils down, in my mind, to two things, uh, desire and discipline. You know, the desire is very important. You have to really, really want to do this. I mean, everybody knows that. You have to want this more than... You've all experienced desire. You meet someone you're very attracted to. Julius is like, oh my God, he's the handsomest man in the world. I have to have him. He's so gorgeous. I can't live without him. He, he called me last night. Oh my God, he's so beautiful. And look, he's amazing. He sings. He dances. He's a, you know, desire. You have no idea. You may think you know. You may place a bet on someone you know, Nadine is very beautiful, so you say, oh, she's definitely got it, you know, she's going to make it, but, you know, someone else is not going to because they don't have, ex don't think like that. Don't think like that. All of this business is relationships, and every relationship is crucial to your career, starting at this moment. What you are like now is the way you're going to be when you start working as an actor, so develop that habit, develop that thinking now of tremendous respect for the other person. This is my style, is develop a sense of respect, especially if you don't like them. Because there's just people, you know, it's just certain people. I meet certain people, I'm like, well, I'm wildly, for whatever reason, attracted to them. You know, not just women either. You know, I like women, but not just women. There are, there are certain men I'm very drawn to, you know, for whatever reasons, and certain people I just, you know, I don't know why. It's human nature. But my experience has taught me to cherish all relationships with the people you like, and especially with the people that you don't like. You know, the people that work the most are the people that can work with the most people, you know. Because you never know. I'll leave you with one last story and then we'll get to work. <clears throat> I'm not a big storyteller for the sake of like a blah blah blah, but if it has a point, you know, it might be useful to your education. So I'm doing a TV show, this is about eight years ago or so, it's called The Jury, and Tom Fontana, he also, he, he did Oz, a TV show I was on. And this was, uh, I guess it was before Oz, which is, became, Oz became a very popular TV show, and Tom is famous for Hill Street Blues and a lot of television in America. You know, he's a great writer, he's a great guy. Um, and anyway, I'm doing this TV show called The Jury, which is 12 people sitting around a table. And, you know, we have to deliberate all day. That's the, the episode. We have to deliberate all day, and then we come to a decision, and, you know, that's the show. So the guy sitting next to me is the main guest artist of the TV show. And I'm like third, fourth maybe. But he's the first one. <clears throat> I think his name is David. You know, good looking fellow, younger than I, younger than me. And um, we, you know, we shoot the scene and the camera, you know, we're in a circle, so the camera's doing the master shot, which is grabbing the whole room. And, and we get to this guy, and he has one line, right? And he can't remember it. So, you know, the director is like, okay, cut, let's do it again. We do it again. He can't remember it. And I'm like, oh, this is like at 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm thinking, this guy's the guest artist. We got a long day here. 
He has pages of speeches. He can't remember one line. So, turns out I was right. He could not remember. I mean, when we went in for his close-ups, they had to hold the script here because he could not remember one word. I mean, one line. He couldn't, like say, uh, well, I think that. He couldn't remember anything. So I'm sitting there going, I'm number four, he's number one, aren't I number one? Right. This is the thinking that I want you to focus on for a moment. So, uh, you know, I'm getting more aggravated. The day is long. We're all inside this hermetically sealed room. There's no air, there's no windows. It's getting very frustrating. You could see the crew. By the way, that's another little tip. Always make friends with the crew. They are your best friends. Get in there. If you're a girl, flirt with them. If you're a guy, make friends with them immediately because you're going to need that crew. You know, they have your back. The way you look in that show is going to have a lot to They usually do their job anyway, but it's just a good idea to get to know the crew. <clears throat> so some part of me had enough common sense. You know, I had a very gregarious and loving mother, and she taught me to like everybody. So I said to the guy, let's have lunch together when it came lunchtime. And it turns out that he had that day, it was a Monday, that Sunday he had to put his father in a nursing home for Alzheimer's. You know the disease where you can't remember anything? Yeah. So this poor guy that I was sending all this negative energy to, that I was condemning in my mind, that I was criticizing in my mind and putting down because he wasn't as good as I am, had just put his own father in a nursing home for that horrible disease for which there is no uh, cure at this point. And I had a great awakening that day. And it was that, you know, Make sure you examine the story of each person before you render a judgment. So it's very easy to judge people. It's very easy for me to look at you and render a judgment. But actors are not good judges. We're not supposed to be. Leave the judgment to someone else. We have to be more like children. We just have to observe people and study them and take them in. The part of you that judges is not a good part for your purposes. Evaluation is not um, useful. It is in analyzing text. It is in studying characters. It's necessary to analyze and evaluate material. So, for example, if we're um, analyzing and evaluating the scene that we worked on last night, you know, the balcony scene, Romeo and Juliet, we have to analyze and evaluate certain facts and circumstances like lawyers do. So, for example, Romeo is at a party. He's with his friends. He probably had a few drinks. You know, he got into an argument with his, his pals. And, um, you know, Juliet is going to be married off to Paris, you know, to someone else. And this, you know, fortuitous or, you know, deadly meeting that they have has circumstances that lead up to it, so it's your job to analyze and evaluate that, but not people, so you understand what I'm saying, okay? Uh, so we're going to do scenes here today, right? And uh, how many people have their scenes memorized? Excellent. That's what I like to see. Um, so we stop at six, is that right? I think right. it's okay with six, yes. Yeah. yeah, okay, good. So let's do a warm-up first, all right? So everybody come up on stage and get into a circle. Get away. Paula? I'm coming, I'm coming. He's coming, he's coming. Hi, sweetheart. Oh, Paul, darling. Well, say something. It's six flights. Did you know it's six flights? It isn't, it's five. What about that big thing hanging outside the building? It's not a flight, it's a stoop. It may look like a stoop, but it climbs like a flight. Is that all you have to say? I didn't think I'd get that much out. 
It didn't seem like like six flights when I first saw the apartment. Why is that? You didn't see the apartment. Uh, don't you remember? The woman wasn't home, so you saw the third floor apartment. Then that's why. You don't like it. You really don't like it. I do like it. I'm just waiting for my eyes to clear first. I expected you to walk in here and say, and say, wow. I will. Okay. Wow. <laughs> oh, oh. It'll be beautiful, I promise you. You just came home too soon. You know I missed you? Did you really? Right in the middle of the Monday morning conference, I began to feel sexy. That's marvelous. Oh boy, let's take a cab back to the plaza. We still have an hour to before checkout time. We can't. We took a towel into ashtrays. We're hot. <laughs> oh my gosh, you still love me. After six days at the plaza? What's the trick? But that was a honeymoon. Now we're on regular schedule. I thought you'd come home tonight and we'd shake hands and start the marriage. How do you do? Oh, my turn to say, well, for a lawyer, you're some good kisser. For a kisser, I'm some good lawyer. What does that mean? Something happened? Something wonderful? Well, for Pete's sake, what? It's not positive yet. Uh, the office is supposed to call and let me know in five minutes. Uh, oh, they called. What? Um, I mean, they are calling. When? Now. They're on the phone now. Where? There. What did you tell me? I forgot. You kissed me and got me all crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Let's stop there. Good read. Okay. Now, uh -huh. did you say something? No. No. Okay. So now, you know, this is the scene, right? It's about two and a half pages. Is that what it is? What it was? Um, no. More. Of, yeah. Two, okay. Two pages. Okay. Two pages. Good. And you, you know, you have two people talking to each other. The first thing you have to do is figure out where they are. That's the first task. Where am I? All right? Once you establish where you are, then you can go into the more critical and important aspects, such as what do I want and how am I going to get it? Now, where are they? They're in an apartment in New York City. What's the time period? 60s, right? Early 60s? Yes. Yeah, and the apartment is, well, it's not in that great a shape, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of, there's nothing there. Isn't that part of the hook? Is it's just, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's no furniture. Yeah. There's a phone. So let's put the phone over here. Um, so let's lose the chairs. Let's take the phone. They didn't have cell phones back then, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't think she has a table in there. Okay, so you, you know you have a phone, that's for sure. Right? And I don't think there's much of anything else. Right? Okay, good. So, you want this one for the phone? Perfect. Okay, so she is on stage by herself and he's off stage. Getting ready to come on. Let's put the door upright here, like this. He has to come in the door. So you're yeah. gonna, yeah, you're gonna make your entrance from here. So the door is here, and she's on the phone at the beginning, isn't she? Yeah. And to whom is she speaking? Um, to his colleague. It's uh, his boss, isn't it? It's his boss. Well, then. Well, they gave him a big case. Yes, of course. Right. This is a great day. This is amazing. Yeah. So um, you go off stage and get ready to come on. And what is her state of mind now that we've, you know, that there's a skylight, there's a phone, uh, there's a bathroom off here. Um, what, what is it that she specifically wants from him in this scene, would you say? And it's, oh, darling, and you go, go up to him. Okay. Okay, one more time. And action. I'm coming. I'm coming. He's coming. He's coming. Oh, Paul, darling. Well, say something. It's six flights. Did you know it's six flights? <laughs> it's not. It's five. What about the big thing hanging outside the building? It's not a flight. It's a stoop. <laughs> it may look like a stoop, but it climbs like a flight. <laughs> Is that all you have to say? 
I didn't think I could do my job. <laughs> good, very good. This is very nice. I love this beginning of it. Um, but I think this will take it. I didn't think I'd get that much out of it. You know how when you're really out of breath. So, so let's go back from the top one more time. That's good. I can move more. Just cross down right, specifically. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm one of those directors that tells actors what to do. I don't care. Ready? Okay. Action. Huh? I'm coming, I'm coming. He's coming, he's coming. Check yourself out. Oh my god, I look great. Let's go. Oh, Paul, oh, darling. Well, say something. It's six flights. <laughs> Did you know it's six flights? It's not, it's five. What about the big thing hanging outside the building? It's not a flight, it's a stew. <laughs> it may look like a stew, but it climbs like a flight. <laughs> well, is that all you have to say? I didn't. I didn't think I'd get that much out. Uh, it didn't seem like six flights when I first saw, saw the apartment. Why is that? You didn't see the apartment. Remember, the woman wasn't home, so you saw the third floor apartment. <laughs> then that's why. <laughs> you don't like it. You really don't like it. I do like it. I'm just waiting for my ass to clear first. <laughs> okay, good. That's that's beautiful. The one that, that's good. The one thing I don't like is this. Pressing arms. Yes, exactly, specifically. You don't like it. You really don't like it because this doesn't say anything to me. Okay. Well, uh, let's go over what's going on here. I mean, you know, you want to make love. You want to get it on. Oh, huh? And he's talking about the, the flights and it. That's all you have to say? I mean, find something else. Give me something else besides this. So you don't like it. You really don't like it. I mean, just wherever you go, whatever happens to you, how does it make you feel if I reject you? Not good, right? Okay, okay good. Let's go back to the top. I always go back to the top of the scene. I always go back from the top, from the top. If you get the top right, then the rest of it generally falls into place. Choice. Because this on stage, well, this means two things. Either you want to be held, or you're not listening. That's what crossing your arms means. So that's not the case here. She wants, she is listening, and she wants to be more than just held. And it doesn't free you, you know? Yeah, that's right. Um, I think you could have a lot more fun with the Cambodian fertility dance. You could, you know, really find out what a fertility dance in Cambodia would be like as he gets more into the briefs. Yeah. But this is terrific work for you. Great job. Way to go. move to something more difficult. Who has a Shakespeare scene here? Uh, Julius and uh, Cassius? Mm -hmm. That's the one you have, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take, uh, it's, okay, the time is really critical here, so it's um, five after two, just a quick five minute break and come back and we'll do Julius Caesar. Okay. We get to Universal's parking lot and they go, hey everybody, you know, brand new 1981 Mustang for you, waiting in the parking lot. And we're all like, great, awesome, this is going to be a blast. I'm in L.A. for five months, I have my own car. He had never driven in his life. He's from the Bronx. He gets in the car, stoned out of his mind, by the way. <laughs> he gets on the 405 in Los Angeles. Do you have any idea what the 405 is like? I mean, it's like... It's a four-lane expressway with people moving very quickly. So the first time he's ever driven, he'll shout. He's, he hears them shouting outside that they're in a tent. Another general shout. I do believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar. Right? Mm -hmm. So what are they doing here? They're here to conspire against... They're, they're planning to kill Caesar. So is that shout... A good thing? Yay, Caesar! I don't know. I have to decide. It's not a good thing. I'm in thinking. It's not a good thing. Okay. Another general shout. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Another general shout. I don't believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are hipped on Caesar. I do believe. I do believe 
that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar? Yeah, um, so first you have to hear the shout. Okay, everybody go, yay Caesar! Yay, yay Caesar! Caesar! Another general shout. I do believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar. Okay, much better. But you have to phrase it all together, right? You're breaking it up. Another general shout. Then you stop, right? Then the second two lines, and the reason why I asked you to get a pen, is because they have to be phrased together. So, also, yeah, underline the verbs, right? I do believe that these applauses are, right, for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar. Vershen? Yeah. Fine. Peep. That's flat. Peep. To find. And find. Yeah. Right. Two is not a verb. Two is a preposition. Peep is the verb. Walk. Uh, uh, doth bestride. And find. They're the verbs. So you use them to trigger you, to punch you into the sense of it. It doesn't mean you always stress verbs all the time, but generally speaking, if you lean on the verb, you'll, you'll find the sense of it, right? So, let's go from the top, Brutus. Ready, and... Yay, Caesar! Another general shout. I do believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar. Why, man, he does bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Not bad. Now, the only thing missing is you don't have a Caesar. Right? You always have to be specific when you're talking about someone. You know, if you're standing there on stage and you're talking about a Caesar, you have to have someone in mind, someone that you know that... Do you like Caesar at this point? No. <laughs> Good. Is there somebody in your life that you don't like? Of course. <laughs> Good. I mean, that's not good, but yeah. use it. <laughs> um, so, put that person... Where's Patrick? Okay, where's Florian? Okay, see where Florian is? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the guy you don't like. Okay. So that's what I want you to refer to. Okay? So I want you to actually look at him. Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus. The whole time, um... No, just refer to it. Just find, you're talking to okay. him, but just mm -hmm. find a place to, to use him. They numbered the emotions, and they would show you, you know, like, this is fear, and, you know, this is, like, they had different postures for each emotion and they would train you in those emotions. They didn't care about what was going on the inside. Was it uh, Comida de Latte? Right, Comida de yeah, yeah. Latte, right. Yeah. But, uh, and it was French, actually. It was a French school of acting that taught this. But then um, Stanislavski came along and he said, okay, you know, what's going on on the inside of the character? What, what is the interior life of this woman? Aside from the fact that she's saying these words, what prompts her to say these particular words? What is her behavior like? And Stanislavski happened to be a very wealthy man, and he had, um, you know, uh, opulent, his parents had estates, and he had a lot of land, and he would take all of his actors, and they would live, and they would rehearse these plays for months and months and months. And they would take a scene like the one we did from Barefoot in the Park, and they, you know, they would spend six weeks on just you coming up the stairs. That's all. So that they could focus on the interior life of the character, and that's where this writing uh, comes into play. So it changes things a little bit. Okay, let's take a listen. She's in mourning, right? This, this is a woman that... that it, let's keep the chair, too. Um, She's in mourning for her husband's life, right? She just lost her husband, so she's wearing a black veil. She's yeah. all in black, and she, you know, probably has a shrine to her husband right here, and, you know, she's kneeling in front of the shrine when this lout comes in and starts asking for his money, right? Yeah. 
So, um, and the whole point of this part of the scene is that he sits down, right, to make himself comfortable. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go? So I think a lot of the scene can play in this relationship where you're standing okay. there. And, yeah. and then, you know, when she calls him a rustic bear, then I think he gets... It's upset. But I, I guess I was under the impression that you were going to do the whole scene from the beginning, but this is okay too. This is probably better. I'll be able to get to more people. So um, let's start from the beginning. I think, um, what's the first thing that you say? Uh, don't get angry, I beg you, madam. Yeah, that's where he sits. So, don't get angry, I beg you, madam, and sit down. And you're, uh, let's just pretend that you're over here mourning your husband, so we'll start you in this relationship. Uh, and, and let's just see what we have. Ready? And action? Florence. Don't get angry, madam. I beg you. I'm not your manager. I like to call things by the right names. I'm not a woman. And I'm in the habit of saying frankly what I think. Okay, pretty good. So, what, what do... What do you want her to feel when you say, don't get angry, madam. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not your manager, but I'm in the have. What do you want her to feel? What is he doing to her? What does he yeah, want I'm her to talking, feel when he says um, those? Like a child, I want to make my... You want to put her down. Yeah, put her, yeah. Right, come on, don't lose your temper, little girl. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Let's start from the beginning. Writing study, where he lives with his mother, uh, who is a famous actress, and she's having an affair with your ex-boyfriend, uh, and has been for quite a long time. In fact, when he met you, he was with her, um, with your mother, and, you know, you were in love with Constantine, and you left Constantine to be with this famous writer, because yeah. you were drawn in by his fame and his good looks, and he was, you know, a middle-aged guy, and he was very successful, and uh, she was so, you know, earlier in the play, she says, oh my God, you're, you're rich, and you're famous, and you're important, and he gets her pregnant, and, and the baby dies, right? I mean, she's had a really tough life, and she's like a... But she's still very naive. Okay. Perhaps uh, she is naive. Um, that's a, certainly a judgment that could be placed on her. I don't know um, how useful that is. What's important is she's still in love with Treplov. Imagine, Treplov's a guy like me. He's like about my age. A very successful writer, you know. He's uh, had a lot of women and he's used a lot of women. So when you think of Treplov, you can think of a guy like, you know, around like my... That's kind of what she got involved with ten years ago or whenever it was that she... Uh, I don't know if she's still naive. She's still in love with him. That's what she's here for. He thinks she's here to see him. But the most important line in the scene is she goes... He's here too. Because she thinks he's in the next room. And that's what most people miss about this scene. They don't realize that she's there to see mm -hmm. one more time yeah. if she has a chance. People don't give up very easily when they're in love. Right? He got your mom. He's got success. He's got fame. He's got money. He's probably not bad looking. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's, he's just... This kid kills himself at the end of this scene. He takes a gun out of the drawer and he blows his brains out. He's in bad shape. He's in, it isn't just at that moment that he takes the gun out. It happens quite a bit before. And it's building up to this point. Suicide is a whole separate topic. Because first of all, it's murder. Any way you look at it, it's murder. You may think, well, I'm just killing myself, you know, what's the problem? Of course, the problem is what you do to everyone around you. The aftermath, what you leave to them. And many great artists have 
course, Shakespeare included, and Chekhov, Chekhov learned playwriting from Shakespeare. They, they, they elaborate, they, um, they, they explain to you why people commit suicide, what is behind a suicidal ideation. You know, part of what's behind his suicidal ideation is that me, Trigorin, I got your girl. That drives you crazy. And not only did I get your girl, I'm a better writer than you. I'm more successful, I'm more rich. How's that make you feel, Constantine? Not very good, does it? Good. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. You're doing great, Seymour. Action. I have talked a great deal about new forms of art, but I feel myself gradually slipping into the beaten track. Placard cried it from the wall, a pale face in a frame of dusky hair. Cried frame that is stupid. I shall begin again from the place where my hero is wakened by the noise of the rain, but what follows must go. This description of a moonlit night is long and stilted. Trigorin has worked out a process of his own and, and, and descriptions are easy for him. He writes that the neck of a broken bottle lying at, on the blank glittered in the moonlight and that the shadows lay black under the mill wheel. There you have a moonlit night before your eyes, but I speak of the shimmering light, the twinkle stars, the distant sounds of a piano melting into the still, into the still scented air, and the result is abominable, abominable, abominable. Yeah! The conviction is get gradually forcing itself up in me that good literature is not a question of forms, new or old, but of ideas that must pull freely from the art. Remember what you're here for, Tregorn. There's someone here. It's either the mother or Tregorin, and you're hoping it's Tregorin. Because they could be in the room next door. Yeah. Okay? But that was really not... This chick is beat up. Uh -huh. <clears throat> She's really beat up. Everybody put, you know, I saw a production on Broadway a couple years ago, and Nina was, you know, beautiful in this beautiful dress. It's so wrong. She is traveling third class. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like with the pigs and chickens. She has no money. She has no clothes. She has no home. Why do you think she says, God bless all homeless wanderers? She's got no place to go. There's no horse and carriage waiting for her. She walked here. She's frozen. That's why it was beautiful that he took your coat off. It's soaking wet. You're freezing for a Russian winter. You, have not, you can't afford any clothes. I don't know if that's naive. I think it's something else. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Am I saying that right? Uh, but anyway, I, I, in writing school, we would have to write a play every week. And we would write a play and turn it in, and then it would come back covered in red ink with the mistakes. And I used to love getting the paper back. And the more red ink, the happier I was, because I knew how good it was going to be after I went back and rewrote it. So try to think of a scene in the same way. The more times you stop and the more times you go back, that just means the more you're going to understand it when you finally go to do it. Most people have the impression that because they have to keep stopping and starting and stopping and starting, that it's not going to be any good, that they're not doing well. So I talked about this with the other class, you know, you have that, it could be a parent, <clears throat> you know, a parental voice inside of you, you know, you're stupid, you'll never do anything right, you know, you're ugly, you're, you're 
you're, you're an idiot, why do you want to be an actor? Whatever the voice is, right, there's an opponent inside of you. That's right. There's an opponent inside of your mind. All of us. No one's any different. You could be the most beautiful woman in the world, and your opponent goes, you're fat. You're ugly. You could be skinny as a rail. You're so fat. Don't forget how fat you are. You could be the smartest man on the planet. Don't forget how stupid you are. Remember. It could have come from a parent. It could have originated from... Maybe not. You know, you have to kill your parents off as an artist. You have to. You have to get rid of them. They have no part in your equation as an artist. Always respect and love them, but they have nothing to do with you as an artist. Your job as an artist has nothing to do with your parents. It's you. Right? That's one thing. The other thing is this notion of an opponent is determined to take you down. It's going to find a way, any way it can, to take you out. That's its purpose, its job. The closer you get to success, the harder it tries. The more accurate you become, the more fulfilled you become, the more realized you become, the harder it works to take you out. You have to be aware of this. And the only way to combat it is with patience and understanding. You're like, oh, oh yeah, there you are again, telling me, you know, <laughs> after 35 years you have no idea what you're doing? <laughs> okay, thanks for sharing. Thanks. <laughs> Kill it! All right, you have to 